Good morning. Thank you very much. What do you think of when you hear the words cultured meat? You might imagine meat from a fancy cultured cow who can speak four different languages and has traveled the world and maybe knows which wine to pair with which cheese. I don't know why this is what I think of, but cultured meat is actually real meat made by growing animal cells in a container called a bioreactor without harming or slaughtering any animals. Cultured meat is also known as cultivated meat or in vitro or clean meat or even lab-grown meat. But it isn't really lab-grown meat because it can be made pretty much anywhere, uh, whether it's in a factory or a farm or even your favorite restaurant. But why do we need cultured meat? Cultured meat could be a safe and sustainable alternative to animal farming. Animal farming is a leading cause of climate change and is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all of transportation combined. That includes planes, trains, automobiles, ships, and everything else. Moreover, animal farming is a leading source of water pollution, and a single steak takes as much water to make as we need for almost three months of daily showers. In the meanwhile, by 2025, it is expected that almost two-thirds of the world will be living under water scarcity, and we will struggle to get access to clean water. And yes, animals are absolutely adorable, but they're not very efficient. And they make absolutely terrible meat machines because they you know, spend most of their days walking or lying around and belching methane. So between 75 to 90% of the food they consume is lost in either body maintenance or as manure and other waste products like tails and kidneys. And this is even for a lack of trying either. The meat we widely consume today were chosen not because they were the most delicious meats, but because they come from animals that were the easiest to, to domesticate and mass produce hundreds of years ago. In the centuries since, they have been bred and inbred and manipulated to become more and more efficient. So the factory farmed Franken chickens that we found in, find in most supermarkets today barely resemble the majestic birds they came from, and they struggle to even lift their own weight. This isn't very different from how it is hard to believe that pugs once came from wolves. The meat we eat today is not at all natural. Livestock production is also the single biggest land use on Earth because it takes up 30% of all of Earth's land. As a result, it is also a leading cause of deforestation and in turn biodiversity and habitat loss, threatening 25,000 species with extinction. 90% of the Amazon's deforestation is for livestock production. But wait, you might be thinking, wasn't all of Amazon's deforestation to grow soy? Who's going to eat all that soy? It's been those vegans all along, hasn't it? <laughs> but no, uh, seriously, 80% um, of the world's soybean crop is fed to livestock, not people. The meat shortages seen across the globe at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic have really exposed how vulnerable our meat supply chains are. Many, many countries rely on meat imports because they don't have the resources or land or the climate to grow the, their meats. And this includes countries like Singapore, which are very small, or countries which are mostly ice or mountains or deserts. And yeah, uh, although livestock takes up all these resources, it provides less than 20% of the world's calories and under 40% of its protein. Today, we produce enough food to feed 1.5 times the world's population of humans. And we can end world hunger pretty much tomorrow with just 40 million tons of food produced a year, and yet 760 million tons of food are fed to animals in farms annually. Unfortunately, all of this is only going to get worse. With increasing populations as well as incomes, it is expected that the demand for meat could as much as double by 2050. Where is all that meat going to come from? And you might be thinking, oh, 2050 is a long way off, and, and we'll probably colonize Mars by then, and, and I'll be on Mars, and, and it's all good, but how are you going to get your meat on Mars? Are we going to be launching cows over there? <laughs> Maybe cultured meat is the only practical way to go about this. Animal farming? 
also happens to be the cause of three out of four infectious diseases, including swine flu, and is the leading cause of antibiotic resistance because it's the place where antibiotics are used more than any other place in the world, including hospitals. Many experts believe that antibiotic resistance might very well be the cause of the next global big pandemic. And I would like to stress that all these statistics and stats that I've been rambling on and on about all come from very reputable sources, like the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization or peer-reviewed journals. But we haven't even yet touched upon the various moral and ethical implications of consuming meat. Although that is not the subject of this talk, I personally decided to become a vegetarian around the age of five because I had this very, very awkward realization that the absolutely delicious chicken I was eating might have had family and friends that miss her. Maybe she had dreams. Maybe she wanted to, you know, uh, have kids or, or travel. But seriously, let's ask ourselves, do we really, really need cultured meat? I mean, why don't we just go around telling people to, you know, just eat your vegetables and go vegan, guys? That'll go well. Well, um, we tried that. Uh, uh, back in my undergrad, I started Meat Free Mondays in London. And, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, back in my undergrad, we started Meat Free Mondays at my university. And, it was, and although we had a small uh, sort of minority against uh, it, it was a relative success. It passed as policy, and uh, meat was not sold in the various student union uh, led. Uh, food outlets on campus on Mondays, and there wasn't really any much uh, impact on sales either. This was all accompanied by a big awareness campaign, and I learned a lot by speaking to people throughout this. I came across people who hadn't realized that beef came from cows, or that pork, ham, and bacon were once part of pigs. This disconnect was absolutely astounding, but it isn't very surprising then to learn that most people don't know about the negative impacts of animal agriculture. To be fair, even I didn't until I started the campaign as a 20-year-old. Anyways, a couple of years passed, and the people who worked on Meat Free Mondays graduated, and soon it was completely phased out. And that was devastating. I mean, I understand it can be hard changing your diet, you know, I, I know from personal experience, uh, but uh, it ha made me realize a couple of things. One, that may be an awkward nerd like me, you know, the kind of nerd that names the robotic arms he works with in industry, uh, does not belong there or belong somewhere else, and that perhaps activism and policy change can only go so far without a viable alternative. Economic pressures have largely been drivers of social, behavioral, and consumer change, often more so than activism. I believe. And, and this is seen, actually, in many examples, like, for example, horse-drawn carriages being replaced by automobiles, not because of concerns about horses or sustainability, but because of costs and efficiency. So I believe that economics, driven by technology, and activism need to go hand in hand in order to help restore our planet. For my PhD, I uh, am trying to sort of help save animals and, and uh, people in my own little way by developing in vitro human brain models to study Alzheimer's and replace animal testing. During this, a colleague helped me realize that the techniques and technologies that I was using uh, to develop and grow human brain cells in the lab could actually be applied to develop and grow meat and leather and various other agricultural products sustainably. It had never occurred to me before that whilst trying to figure out ways to potentially help restore the human brain, I would learn ways uh, and skills that could potentially help restore our planet. But how does all this work anyway? Well, we start off by taking uh, and isolating cells from a small sample from an animal without harming it or from a scrap piece of meat from a slaughterhouse. With the right kind of cells, a single small vial can produce millions and millions of kilos of meat, provided that they are given the right nutrients, which usually come through this sugary liquid called cell culture media, or cell growth media. And this contains all the various vitamins, minerals, proteins, and everything the cells need to grow and turn into meat. And so it's very important and often the most expensive ingredient. 
All of this happens in a bioreactor, which ensures that the cells have the optimal and ideal conditions and environment to grow in, much like nature, actually. And so the meat we get at the end of it is veal meat, and it can be identical down to the molecular level to the farms, animal farm meats we eat today. And it can also um, be the same in terms of things like taste, uh, much more so than plant-based alternatives like soy, which you may not like. And furthermore, it can be made without genetic modification or antibiotics necessarily. And yes, yes, I know that your steak tastes absolutely divine, but can we really claim that any of the meats we've ever consumed are the most um, sort of uh, delicious meats possible? With cultured meat, we can mass produce even the most tastiest venison every day at low cost. And because the process, it works pretty much the same way regardless of species, so why stop there? Why not try kangaroo meat or crocodile meat? The possibilities are absolutely endless. In fact, as we speak today, there is a company in Europe trying to develop cultured lion burgers. Furthermore, because there's no slaughterhouse or decomposition or even a potentially unhygienic barn involved, cultured meat is expected to have much longer shelf lives and require fewer preservatives compared to animal farming. And I think it's important to also stress that as time goes on, we'll have more control over the meat production process. So the meats could be tailored to your personal taste as well as dietary needs and become more and more healthy. And yes, yes, all this sounds potentially very exciting, but how far away are we from having cultured meats on our plate in reality? Well, not very, because Singapore actually approved cultured meat and products containing it can be purchased today. Cultured meat is a real blessing for food security because it can be produced vertically over several floors of a building, pretty much anywhere, whether it's a desert or even Mars. In fact, in 2019, cultured beef was actually grown at the International Space Station. It isn't very surprising then that countries like Singapore and Qatar who have had food security issues and want to become more self-sustainable are the leading the way for cultured meat production. Producing meats locally can further reduce uh, emissions as well as energy requirements because there's no need for refrigerated and frozen shipping. And then uh, I think it's also important to think about where are all the meat companies in all of this? Well, many of them are actually actively backing cultured meat, while some are, you know, casually flirting with it. Two of the world's five biggest meat corporations have already invested in cultured meat, whilst one has straight up purchased a cultured meat company. But it's very important to note that cultured meat still isn't at price parity with animal farming. Without even going into all the various subsidies that animal farming gets, this is a multi-objective optimization problem that entails finding the best cells and ingredients like media, processes, and hardware, which many, many companies are coming closer and closer towards solving every single day. The world's first cultured meat burger, which you see right here, costs $300,000 to produce. You won't get this in the McDonald's. But, uh, uh, right now, but yeah, it, is, um, it was made in 2013. So why is it taking so long? Cell culture has been around for decades. Uh, and, um, but advances in growing the cells of mammals um, outside the body, which is what cultured meat entails, largely come from the industries of pharmaceuticals and healthcare, which are very high profit margin and small scale industries. And so pretty much the opposite of food. Countries like USA have had to designate two entirely different organizations to regulate cultured meat because uh, the one for the first part, which is for up, everything up to the bioreactor, and one for the food processing and so on, because there's such a vast dissonance between the end product and the way it's produced. I believe that applying, adopting, and crucially scaling up techniques and technologies from life sciences, as well as finding the optimal conditions and processes are going to be absolutely critical and are the biggest challenges. Solving, without solving these, all we'll end up with is a massive vessel full of sugary liquid and a bunch of dead cells, but no meat. 
Yet, this industry has seen some of the fastest cost reductions for impactful technologies in history, comparable to gene sequencing as well as uh, transistors. However, we cannot do this without you all. We need cell scientists and veterinarians for the cells, farmers and biologists for media, engineers for the bioreactors, programmers for automation, designers and architects to build the facilities, food scientists, chefs, and so many, many more people to come together to tackle this immensely interdisciplinary challenge. And there's plenty for lawyers to do as well, because most countries haven't set out regulations. And there are so many, many unknowns. Like, how is cultured meat going to be labeled? Is it considered vegetarian or vegan? Is it considered halal or kosher? Or will there be completely new labels altogether? I think that we are at, we, this is a sort of a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity to shape the way we feed the world and make change that hasn't been seen at such large scales comparable to the digital revolution of the last century or even the agricultural revolutions. This is an incredibly exciting industry to be a part of, and we are on the verge of this massive wave that's going to revolutionize the way the food is produced forever. It is time for meat to basically be brought into the digital age using technologies fit for the 21st century. It is time for meat production to undergo a renaissance. Thank you very much.